What's up guys, Tyler here. So I decided to make a video on the City Museum in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I've been working, I'm in construction, and I've been working in a building that's connected to the City Museum. And if you don't know much about the City Museum, it is a huge tourist attraction here in St. Louis. Uh, I think some uh, something like 800,000 people go through this place per year. And it seems like a fantastical place. I mean, it is literally filled with everything a kid would ever want. It's basically designed for kids. And it is a huge playground that's... It's in an 11-story building, and there's a playground on the roof. It's compiled of things that basically would be junk to somebody. They turn into a playground. And after working there for a year, I started noticing some of the artwork and some of the sculptures and statues were just really standing out to me and I'll explain I'll explain this in a minute. I just started getting this intuitive hit like maybe the city museum isn't what everybody thinks it is. So I started doing some research and I came up with some pretty wild stuff. And I'm going to share it with you guys. So I hope I don't sound crazy going into this because it might seem a little out there, but if you are really aware of what's going on in the world, I don't think that this is going to seem that far-fetched. So as I'm sure you've already gathered, the City Museum is a family-friendly place. Uh, people even get married here, kids go on field trips here from all of the surrounding schools. Uh, like I said, 800,000 people a year roughly go in and out of this place. But once you're inside, it's really almost shady. You have to sign a waiver to even get in because so many people get hurt. It's extremely easy to lose your kids in here. You can turn your head and it will be gone. There is a cave system. There are tunnels. There's underground passageways, secret doors. It is so impossible to actually keep a good eye on your child while you're in there. It's very difficult. So when I started researching the City Museum, I actually, it actually turned into me researching the original owner, the founder, Bob Cassidy. This guy is anything but ordinary. He is the definition of a starseed. I actually read his biography and it has insights from his friends and his wife and uh, co-workers. So I really had to paint a picture of who this guy was to help me make sense of what's been going on in the city museum which is very subliminal it's not really gonna pop out at you but there is some type of reptilian luciferian satanic agenda I'm not exactly sure uh, we're even gonna get into some pizza gate stuff it's just really crazy the stuff I started noticing so I started actually noticing something was up just when the, the statues outside started catching my eye. And I walked by them for years. I used to go to the city museum all the time. And I walked by them for years never really understanding or even thinking about what they could actually be symbolizing or what they could mean. So what I noticed is that the entire place is surrounded by and guarded by uh, reptilians, giant serpents, dragons, um, lizard people. The statues explain themselves. There is actually a pizza joint across the street called the Sliced Pint. It's an, an adult pizza place that serves beer. The sign on the back of the building has people eating pizza with what I could best describe as a lizard man, a reptilian. So I, I was like, this is too weird. Something is going on here. I started taking a closer look and there's a really weird ancient Egyptian theme going on. And it just, it just really wasn't setting right with me. So I started taking pictures. I actually came to work early one morning and went in the employee entrance of the city museum 
and because I know where it's at just from working there. And I wear an orange shirt in construction and the employees of the city museum wear orange shirts as well. So I just walked in like I knew what I was doing. And I started walking around the city museum uh, by myself. No one was in there. I just started taking pictures and really looking around at all the stuff. And I was shocked at how demonic some of this stuff was. Even on the roof of the city museum, this is the biggest thing to me. It is being protected by a giant praying mantis, a mantis being. So anybody in this community, in the awakening community, understands what I'm talking about here. We have reptilians, we have mantis beings that are both known as negative ETs. So my question was, what drove this artist, what drove Bob Castley to design and decorate this place like he did? But before I get into everything, I'm going to go through some of these pictures that I took and kind of explain to you what they mean to me. So here I have a, what, this is the men's and women's restrooms, and it looks like, to me, a depiction of the devil, uh, subliminally. And if you zoom in, it's a woman's face with horns. And if you zoom in even more on the drinking fountain, it says, come be refreshed. When you walk in the front door, the first thing you're greeted by are three serpent beings, three snake-like creatures uh, that's not very welcoming especially for a child's museum literally every nook and cranny of this place is some type of reptile some type of dragon some type of serpent being uh I'm everywhere everywhere you look so even this egyptian photo that i showed earlier almost appears to be what well, looks like mantis beans, three mantis beans. I know you really have to look and think outside the box here, but that's what I'm seeing. It's this isn't normal artwork. The pathway to the elevator has serpent beans directing you which way to walk. Even this column has a demon face, a demon looking face on it. And actually the closer you get to it, the creepier it gets. We have another column with a bat type of goblin, uh, very creepy, stuff that you typically wouldn't think would be in a kid's museum. We have some other kind of odd looking, I guess you could say, E.T. alien faces. Some very, very unique stuff going on here. Another theme that I noticed is the topless women. I know some of these are mermaids. Some of them are covered up, but there are a lot of topless women for being in the Children's Museum as well. But my favorite one was as I was leaving, I noticed the first aid station. And above the first aid station, I noticed this. Now, if this doesn't just wrap it all up and put a bow on top, then I don't know what does. We have the Eye of Providence, the all-seeing eye. Uh, this is on the dollar bill, and if anybody knows anything about our currency, uh, there's a lot of symbolism there as well. So, this says Illuminati. It, this, is, this tells me there is, that this artist, Bob Castley, had some type of influence, some type of demonic influence, which actually turns out to be the case. And now we're gonna get into some of his biography and we're gonna go into what kind of guy Bob was. Instead of going into his entire biography, I'm just gonna go through and point out the stuff that stood out to me. So right here it says, he thought of his talent, experienced his talent as a pathology, she says. That was always the word he used. Not a disease he wanted to cure, but a beloved demon inside of him that spoke and drove him. He loved the craziness and the havoc, the creative chaos that it caused, but he was keenly aware of the consequences, the hurt that it brought, and he ultimately felt like he had no choice. He had no specific plans, just random ideas 
for what they dubbed the Museum of Things That Could Kill You. Pretty crazy, right? Okay, so now understanding that there truly may have been a demon working through him to create this artwork, to create this museum, I started reading in between the lines and translating this into my own perspective. So as we move on, this one states that Bob's forms move around, dive into each other, appear and disappear and reappear. Having things play against each other was very important. Having it be as if it would know one thing in control, but multiple principles competing against each other in almost a survival of the fittest. There was something fierce in Bob's work. Even if he was working on a tranquil garden, it felt powerful. Okay, so if it isn't crazy enough already, it gets even worse. So let's keep going. The City Museum cave wall was originally going to be a giant woman and children would climb up on her. The serpent fence, you ever look at it from above? It's the man's view of his penis. So now remember earlier when I told you it's very easy to lose your kids in here. It's pretty, it's scary. If, if I was a parent, I don't know that I would actually want to take my kid here, especially the way things are today with the human sex trafficking and all this stuff that's, that's taking place, which we'll get into here a little bit more in a minute. So moving forward, one of the few rules enforced by staff at City Museum is that minors be accompanied by an adult. Bob used that rule as the tension for a lot of his art. Holes in the floor led to tunnels that came up out of sight of their entrances, separating adults and kids. Spans connected platforms that could be reached faster by crawling than by walking around. To keep up with their kids, adults had to join them or lose them. That only bothered the adults. Now this next one refers to a project that he was involved in prior to his time at the City Museum. But he and Gail also started hiring kids from the neighboring projects to do odd, no doubt, truly odd jobs. Being that this is a kids museum and the stuff I've already talked to you about, there's really something off here. There's something really off, at least in my opinion, you guys please do your own research on this. Uh, I may be the first person to even look at this and from this perspective, I don't know. Steck remembers Bob at an erotic art show playfully inscribing penises on women's bodies with a Sharpie. Others remember him drawing on people's faces at city museum parties. Most were delighted, although a few headed for the restroom to frantically scrub off the impropriety. And one last one to kind of give you another sense of Bob's personality. Bob also threw tantrums worthy of a two-year-old. Steck says he once tossed a tow truck driver across his truck. Then there was the relentless mischief and the sexual license. I'm not exactly sure how to take that, but seeing what we've already saw already, I think you can pretty much paint a picture um, what that means. A few other things to note that I didn't put in here. One is that Bob actually had a 20-foot boa constrictor for a period of time that he kept as a pet in the basement of the city museum. And I don't believe that he kept it caged and this bothered a lot of the employees. You either had to like it or leave because the snake was staying and it freaked out a lot of people, but he was obsessed with this snake. He had to have this snake, which goes along with the theme of the entire museum itself. And one of the other things that jumped out to me is that I, when I was reading, one of the things he said was that he wasn't concerned about what any newspaper review, any article said as far as how great the city museum was. All he cared about was if the kids liked it. So he had a really unique relationship with children. Now, whether all of this was done intentionally, which I don't believe it was, I don't think, it, I don't think at this time people had a spiritual understanding of how things work. So he may have had no idea that he really truly had an attachment or maybe he did. Uh, that's something that you can decide. So it's just one of those things where you really need to take a step back and, and think about, you know, think about 
how all this stuff in our world is right in front of our faces all the time and we just don't see it because we're blind to it. We're sleeping, essentially. Doing my research, I noticed after I was done going into everything, I came across an ad that said, the city museum in St. Louis better than Disneyland. Now, what do we know about Disneyland? Uh, as of late, we've been hearing a lot of information come forward about, you know, this pedophile ring existing within Disneyland, an underground tunnel system, and children go missing there all of the time. So that brings me to my next point. We know there's an underground tunnel system in Disneyland. Uh, kids go missing, who knows what for the, the human sex trafficking, but there's a lot of shady stuff going on there. So there is also a known tunnel system underneath the streets of St. Louis. It's probably used, it was probably used around a hundred years ago. They think it's old cobblestone uh, streets that trolley cars traveled on. I know there was a mafia, you know, the St. Louis mafia or mob that used it at one point. And there's also not just tunnels, but in a, a cave system underneath St. Louis that extends for miles, not just in the St. Louis, but the surrounding areas. And so that's just one factor to, to add to play into this whole story to just help tie everything together. Now, I don't know exactly how many people or how many children, if any, have gone missing from the city museum, but it's all pretty suspicious. So that's what, that's what even drove me to start looking into this in the first place. And actually, if you look at the back of the city museum, so it's, it's a huge building. There is a lot of that building that I'm not really sure what it's used for, what goes on there, if anything, uh, but it's a pretty big building and the museum only takes up, I would say, a quarter of it. I know there's some other offices and stuff, and there is a wedding reception hall on the top floor. Uh, but other than that, I really don't know what takes place in there. So who knows, who knows what's in the basement, who knows where it goes, if it ties into this tunnel system. Because the exposure that's taking place in the world right now on all of the satanic ritual abuse to pedophiles, the sex trafficking, all of that stuff is being exposed on a massive scale. And when I started noticing this stuff, it, so it sounded like a lot of the stuff I was reading, a lot of these articles, a lot of the stuff I was researching into. So this could very well tie into all this, or maybe not. Maybe this was just something that happened while Bob was alive and now it's over with. Uh, the city museum's still operating and still going and thousands of people go there every day. So who knows? Now, one of the main things that is suspicious about all of this is Bob Cassidy's death, the way he died. So the official story states that he was doing an excavation at his newest project, Cementland, which I'm not even sure if it ever opened. I don't believe it did. But he was excavating, and the story says that he rolled down the hill in his bulldozer and died during the accident. And this was the official story for years until uh, an investigator came in and, and noticed that the markings on his body didn't match the story. So he started looking into it and determined that Bob was beaten to death. This is the only conclusion he could come up with. Actually, they found, they went back to the scene, went back to the photos, they found a bloody rock at the scene. There was, there was a... Uh, just there was blood all over the the, the bulldozer that just in places it would have not been nothing was adding up essentially and what makes it even more curious is that two weeks prior to his death two gunmen walked in they broke into his son's house and shot his son his son actually lived through it but there was some type of somebody some type of attack somebody was out to get Bob and possibly his family so there's been rewards out, $100,000 rewards that were going out to anybody who had any evidence on his death and who murdered Bob Cassidy. So that in itself tells you that there was something going on with this guy that was, that no one had any idea about. So I hope you enjoyed this video. When I started getting into all this stuff, I never intended on making a video. I never thought in a million years I would be 
making a video about anything anyway and posting it online to the world. Um, but I, I just felt compelled. Maybe some other people might have some information or maybe I might have opened up some eyes to certain people or I might just sound even crazier than other people thought I was already. So anyway, just remember, keep your eyes open everywhere you go because all of this stuff that's going on in the world is really literally right in front of our faces, but we're just too distracted to notice it. So just start paying attention. This world is not what we've been led to believe. I say this all the time, but it's really the truth. History is a lie. I mean, really, everything that we thought we knew, we are wrong about. We, there is so much unlearning that has to happen to relearn what really took place on this planet. Because we're never going to go anywhere unless we truly know where we came from. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time.